Skydio is doing. Um, for now, for the question session, I would suggest that we go backwards through all the three talks and I'll just try to carefully go over all questions. Um, Antonio, if I miss a question, please feel free to remind me. I as well saw that uh, Luca already started to answer them in the chat. I, I think I'll as well go to some of the answered questions as well to, as I think there are questions for as well for the broader audience. But I'll start with Hike. Um, Hike, can I start with one question from my side? Um, so you said as well, you're interested in dealing with high-speed flight and how the aerodynamics change. Are you doing that already or is this something that you do not tackle at all? So particularly like as you're now flying very close to obstacles, do you consider that the dynamical model is changing of your, um, of your platform? Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we have a speed limit on our drones. Um, it's it's a speed that includes full autonomy, right? So we don't we don't really allow flying faster manually just because of the nature of our of our product. And we have to choose what that speed limit is based on kind of, you know, how well our perception works, how well we can handle the aerodynamics, and how well the the power system can can handle the you know the, those limits. And, and those are all active constraints. And I think. We definitely model these aerodynamic effects as best we can and are kind of fitting them and trying to understand and improve our models. Um, there's not a learning component there right now, at least an online learning component. There's kind of estimation of a small number of parameters, um, which is really useful, but um, it's, you know, I'm highlighting it as, as very much an active thing. You know, when you're when you're flying at very high speed, trying to avoid obstacles, you you hit the power limits, you hit these weird effects that you you know you're trying to explain and fit and improve, um, and it's it's very much a place where we can, we can do better. Yeah, that uh, I completely understand that. I just quickly had to jump back to the questions because some of the questions I just wanted to ask, ask were just now upvoted. Um, so, um, the first question is from Remy. Um, how do you guys handle the rolling shutter effect, especially in the context of dynamic obstacle avoidance? Hi, that's a question for you. Sorry. Oh, uh, should I sorry. repeat? Oh, sorry. So the question was from Remy. How do you guys handle the rolling shutter effect, especially in the context mm -hmm. of uh, fast motion? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically, a lot of modeling um, and some some learning so they, they kind of play together so the the rolling shutter i mean if you if you have a model of your your camera then you you know kind of what it's going to do um if the big thing is rotation versus translation if it's really rotation only and you're not close enough for the translation effect of rolling shutter to be significant then you can really kind of compensate that using your gyroscope um, if you're flying close to something um, then the rolling shutter effect starts to be significant at speed and it depends on the depth of your scene so you now have to couple the estimation of your depth with your understanding of rolling shutter and there are some interesting ways we we do this but ultimately it's you know know the model of rolling shutter then if you have correspondences then you can you can back that out and appropriately kind of get um the the geometry that's not uh you know warped I think that explains very well. I think I have one last question for you. Let me try to find it again um, before we go to the next talks. So um, wait a second, where was the question? So here, um, are you doing anything special to deal with thin objects since consumer drones will be facing these kinds of objects often? Yeah, um, in terms of our obstacle avoidance, I think we, we spent, years optimizing for thin objects because they're they're the hardest in particular thin branches and power lines are kind of our worst enemy and um just in terms of like data training architectures of, of the deep networks um i think classical approaches just aren't aren't there for it it's it's all about learning and deep networks are also kind of tend to be bad at thin things because of convolutional convolutions and they like smooth results. Um, so very much a challenge, a huge area of effort. Um, and I think we've, we've probably focused on thin, you know, avoiding thin things more than uh, any other um, company company out there. Um, still, we still hit them in, in some ways where we become limited by the kind of actual camera lens quality. And if you if you can see it in the images, often our, our deep networks can see it. Um, but uh, that's of course an area where we want to improve in, in future drones. Makes totally sense. 
Okay, my next question is for Antonio. And I saw you already answered it as well in the chat. Um, so basically here is the question, replacing perception and planning with a neural network. The problem is in aviation, you need certification after some time and such black box neural networks have problems of explainability and certification. Your view regarding the same PRs. Yes, um, so like yeah, I already had like uh, gave, gave a, a quick uh, quick answer to this uh, like on the chat. Uh, I think it's a, a really really interesting problem. And like the second part of in my second part of the talk, I try to give a first answer, an intuition. Uh, basically, there are several uh, several ways. Uh, like of course, like the simplest is to like uh, uh, detect uncertainties and kind of predict them together with you know your neural network predictions uh, in this case you will be able to detect some uh, some failures like for example if your data is too noisy or uh, if something is bad in your uh, training data set this you can detect but of course you cannot remove these mistakes completely so uh, in those cases like uh, if a mistake will happen you might uh, well switch to a safety mode on the other side, like I think uh, what is uh, more interesting and what's now happening a lot in the literature is basically to include uncertainty at training time and at policy time, basically to build controllers that are uncertainty aware. Um, we've seen a lot of this, and I think this is really uh, the way to go. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, this is really an open problem. Um, whenever you have a vision like uh, in the loop, then uh, like you can never give, uh, um, or at least uh, like this is, uh, uh, I, I think my opinion, maybe I, I could be proven wrong, you can never give 100% uh, uh, performance, uh, performance guarantees because you don't know what actually you're going to see or what's, uh, what's going to happen. So this is a very exciting research problem, both for academia and industry and uh, yeah, looking forward to more research in this. Great. Um, next question for Davide um, from Burak Lux I think as well, you answered as well already in the chat, but I think that's as well a great general question. Um, latency as low as three milliseconds is amazing. If I did not understand it wrong, you mentioned that it implied possibilities for sensing and avoiding when cruising with the aerial robot up to 10 meters per second. Considering the flight envelopes and the efficient flight speeds of greater aerial vehicles, I think he means bigger, um, with lift generation surface, this velocity is still very low. Would it mean sense and avoid for such great and high speed aircrafts, the low latency would not be decision maker, but actually the means and allowing low distance obstacle detection? Yes, the answer is yes, you are correct. Indeed, we are talking about mm. more mini drones, right? The, the yeah. smaller you go, the more agile they are. So, and then uh, the lower is the mechanical latency of the platform. So you remember in my presentation, the formula, maximum speed is a sensing range divided by three, uh, by the sum of three latencies, the sensing latency, the perception latency, and then there is the mechanical latency, okay? So we are assuming that basically the, you know, the mechanical latency is very small. So the smaller you go, the more, of course, you can Im improve the speed, increase the, the total speed. So. We already achieved uh, perfor uh, uh, the performance of uh, relative speeds uh, of uh, up to 10 meters per second for larger platform, of course, that is not uh, significant. So you, the event camera will not make any, any change there because you don't have enough, uh, enough reaction times to avoid birds or other things. So everything that we, I was talking about makes sense for smaller, smaller drones. I mean, we have done work with um, Crazy fly that are 27 grams, eight centimeters in diameter. Luca is also working on that with the Navion project. So all these things then make sense because think of flies. Flies move in zigzag motion. So the agility of the platform is inversely proportional to the radius of the platforms. Okay, so imagine that in the future, five to 10 years, yesterday there was a keynote speech at ICRA about uh, a small uh, agile, uh, uh, ro flying robots with the uh, muscular um, uh, motors. So with artificial mo uh, um, yeah. uh, with bio-inspired motors. So you understand basically where we are going. The idea is to go towards the, uh, the B sides, the fly size, and there are all these things, uh, low latency sensors will make in even, even more sense. Okay, thanks for the answer. I am Luca, there is one question for you and as well, I saw that you answered as well already, um, but I think it's well, a great question. How well does dynamic masking work in the presence of densely populated scenes like crowd situations? Yeah, so, so uh, let me start by saying, I think Tony uh, took several questions here and uh, Tony just for context is the first order on the work. So big kudos to, to him like, you know, for uh, several results and, uh, and uh, you will uh, for sure 
be uh, able to give like you know great answer better than, than, than what I can give right now. Um, for the dynamic masking costs of the current um, uh, you know with up to two months around the robot, and what happens is that the implementation. Oh, Luca, I think I would suggest, like, you know, these in sorry, I think I would suggest that you switch off your video. Uh, you were very lagging in your answer. I, I got that impression. So my internet is acting up. I apologize for that. So um, I was saying that we tested in simulation and you can find the results in the paper. We tested uh, Chimera with 60 humans moving around and we still were able to get good VAU results and good 3D reconstruction. Of course, if uh, um, uh, many humans are moving around the camera. Essentially, the 3D reconstruction will be a little bit sparser because uh, the robot, the camera is not going to see like you know the static part of the environment. But we are pretty robust to that. Uh, the catch, I believe, in practice is that uh, dynamic masking works well as long as the semantic segmentation of the humans is reliable. So you still have to be careful about uh, what you use for the for the segmentation of the humans, either mask or CNN or similar networks. Perfect, thanks. Um, I think we start now a little bit more of the general discussion as we're anyway already running out of time. Um, and actually, I would like to use one of the thoughts of Davide to ask a question to all of you. So Davide, you were saying that humans actually have a delay from perception till reaction of about 120 milliseconds, which is quite a lot, right? Given what humans are able to do. So my question for all of you would be, do you really think that it is actually required to have faster sensors or actually should be more aim of a broader understanding of the scene? Because I think how humans solve that lack or this longer delay is basically there a lot more predicting, first of all, unobserved spaces and unseen spaces. And as well, they are much better in predicting the future state of, for example, the drone when they're in charge of controlling the drone. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, well, then I can start. Yes, I totally agree with you. So we measure this latency on uh, with an eye tracking device, by the way, and basically we measure the, the, the correlation that uh, changes in the eye gaze fixations would induce in uh, changes in uh, contrasty commands. Okay, and we measure this as 220 milliseconds. It's a lot, but it's not a surprise because a car racing uh, drivers have ex exhibit the same latency okay so it's similar a little bit less than 220 uh, between 150 and 180 so it seems that because the probably we conjecture because they have to plan in 2d while drone uh, uh, pilots have to plan in 3d so uh yes exactly as you said i believe that actually they can make more consistent decisions with the higher uh, semantic understanding of the thing. So you have to consider also when you send commands to the drones, I mean, uh, you have to uh, be consistent over time. You don't want to actually have uh, like, you know, a very reactive uh, motion and so abruptly change your decision from time to time. So that's something that humans are very good at that. But I leave also the word to the other two speakers. Yeah, my, my See, intuition. If I can is... jump. Go ahead. Go ahead, like. Uh, all right. Yeah, my, my intuition quickly is just that I think humans have really good judgment and semantic understanding. And while we hope to one day match that, it, it doesn't hurt to get the wins we can, which is if we can achieve lower latency than humans, then then great. You know, that's that's a that's an easier win than AGI. OK, do you want to comment on that as well? I guess if I can jump right in again, I, I don't, yeah, I'm hoping that my internet helps me face. We've seen uh, uh, the 3D dynamic scene graphs is this capability of, of getting like, you know, different level of abstraction for which uh, when you do prediction, you can essentially reason in terms of a different level of abstraction. You can think about high level goods. For example, a human is trying to go to the kitchen and you can reason at the, uh, uh, you know, low level prediction about obstacle avoidance like that. But I agree that, you know, we should have uh, to just decouple performance from the sensing limitation. We should have a high level understanding and we should have sophisticated prediction, which must rely on learning. 
Um, that brings me, I think, already now to the last question. I think that's the question that has to be always answered. Um, what do you think? What are the domains where learning is the better tool to use? And which are the domains where we have to continue to use model-based systems? And um, where, where do you think, where is the balance between them? David, do you want to start? Yeah, so My end, but then, it doesn't work okay, okay, so we have uh, used a little bit all the flavors of, uh, we have uh, started with uh, switching one model-based module to a, a, a model-free one. For example, the perception model is the one that we switched first. So for our paper, Deep Drone Racing, where what we did is that we used a neural network to detect gates. Uh, but then everything else, so the so estimation, uh, planning, and control was then uh, relying on standard modules. And the reason why we did that is because um, handcrafted um, object detectors are just you know, not, not working uh, as good as uh, uh, learning-based methods at that. Now what we are doing, though, is that we are also trying to see, uh, as Antonio showed, how replacing other modules like planning and control can work. So we did this uh, uh, scientific investigation uh, that Antonio showed. Can we basically replace those three modules directly with the neural network? And we showed that it works for, uh, for different tasks, uh, so acrobatic maneuvers and flying uh, among obstacles. The problem is the interpretability. So we don't know basically you know, what exactly is doing and how much data is actually needed for training. So that's one thing. Then there is another thing that we're actually model, uh, uh, data-free models are actually very good, which is, um, so data, data, uh, database, uh, data-driven models are very good, which is, for example, aerodynamic effects. Uh, we have another work, which is going to be presented at RSS, where we learn the residuals so between uh, the ground truth and uh, a model based on, uh, on first principles. So the residuals is learned by a neural network and we are able to compensate for very uh, high level uh, uh, aerodynamic effects like turbulences and rotor to rotor interaction. So basically there, there definitely helps. Others? I think, I think there's a spectrum of, of what you can learn from, from you know, estimating a single parameter online to having kind of a model-based prior inside the structure of your deep network to totally just model free and end to end. And I think you know, the, the obvious thing is just when you're comparing images and rich data, like rich sensor data, um, it just you, learning that is just eminently the, the right idea. Um, and if you have, you know, the, the best, in my mind, the best case scenario is you can like learn as much end to end as possible. And then you can use that learning process to figure out a good model. Like it would tell you, here's some interpretable intermediate states that you can reason about and use and understand. And I'm still kind of getting that full signal end to end. And I think that's a, that's a hard thing to do, um, but is kind of, you know, it's an iterative process to figure out what's the right structure of, of things to leave the right stuff to learning. Um, so I'm definitely not a, you know, arbitrary model free fan, but it, there's just, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to do. And I, I think an interesting company to look at is um, Wave. So it was a, a previous uh, Alex Kendall, who's an awesome research intern we had many years ago, who's started a company that is working on self-driving, but uh, basically based on full end-to-end -end learning, but they also have lots of intermediate outputs like the flow, the segmentation, uh, controls, all of these things that they reason about, but they, they do a lot of work to train end-to-end. -to -end. So they have a lot of interesting blogs that I think uh, you know talk about these, these aspects. Thanks. I think I'll come to my very last question on that very first session. Um, and this is summarizing a lot of comments in the question and answers box. Um, one thing is we're maybe seeing the rise of people transporting EV toll vehicles that are flying autonomously. And sometimes I have them feeling that we who work on drones live in our small toy world. And I'm wondering, what is your impression? What can we contribute to this world where we're more talking about 
flying taxis, flying EV toll vehicles, and what can we contribute with the knowledge that we gained over the last 15, 20 years to that community? Yeah, I think we 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 at Skydio like to think that we'll be contributing to manned flight in in useful ways, and of course our our strategy is kind of let's get these things safe and reliable and trustworthy at a small scale where it's super fast to iterate and do research and then grow out you know then do larger scale larger scale things and the again the autonomy and safety might be a, a useful part of that um so i think in in some ways the most immediate thing is just advancing the state of the art by enabling rapid iteration on small and safe platforms um where the technology can can kind of grow up um Thanks. I think Luca, you're trying to answer. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a sense, I think that uh, that um, the challenges for for larger platforms are a little bit different. I would say that in in a sense, there are more challenges about you know getting the human in a comfortable like you know uh, doing a comfortable flight with like you know reasonable noise levels. But I think on the on the perception side, probably the noise. Uh, yeah. Oh, Luca, we're losing you again. <laughs> All right, guys, I will pass then. <laughs> okay, David, do you want to comment as well? No, I think it's okay. I think everything has been said. Uh, okay. uh, Antonio, do you want to make a final comment? I think uh, we had a very interesting discussion. I don't know. It's all, uh, all covered yes then i want to thank again all the four speakers that was really a very very